Hi everyone, welcome back to our channel. We are very happy that so many of you have subscribed to our channel. If you haven't yet, please do and hit that bell as well so you get a notification every time we put up something new. We're very happy for all of you and the more that subscribe, the more videos we are going to be able to make for you as well. Now, today's topic is one of the big ones. It is fertilizer or nutrients for your indoor plants. And as usual, we're going to divide this up into different parts. And we have, why do we use fertilizer? What is fertilizer or nutrients? When do we use fertilizer? And how much do we fertilize? And late, the last one is nutrient deficiency. What is that? So, moving on. Now, there is a big misperception about fertilizer or nutrients and that is when I ask that question to people what is fertilizer or what is nutrients uh, one of the most common responses are it's, it's food for the plant uh, and that is wrong um, so we have to start by figuring out what is food for the plant because we're going to get back to that during this video so food for the plant is created by the plant in a process we call photosynthesis. Now what is that? Well, it is sunlight plus water plus carbon dioxide. Together these components the plant creates what we call C6H12O6. And another word for that is actually sugar. It creates carbohydrates or sugars. And this is the food for the plant. Now, if the nutrients aren't food for the plant, then what is it? Well, we have to look at it as a supplement to the food and a supplement to all of these processes we have inside of the plant. Now the best way to subscribe it is to compare it to vitamins for us, for our bodies. Now we don't need vitamins to survive short term. To survive short term we need carbohydrates, fats and proteins. That is food for us, for humans. But in the long run we also need vitamins as a supplement because it helps us get a better immune system. It helps us to get a better bone structure. It helps all of the processes inside of our body to become more efficient. And that is how we look at the fertilizer or the nutrients for the plant. It's a supplement. Now, short term, the plant doesn't need nutrients or fertilizer, but in the long run, it needs that to keep all of these processes to continue to work within the plant to create this and for, because this is the food for the plant. So moving on then more specifically what is fertilizer or nutrients? Now there are two different types of fertilizer or nutrients. We have the organic and we have the inorganic fertilizer. Now the organic when, that we use outside. It's uh, plant residue, it's manure, it's compost, but we rarely use that indoors because it usually has a smell to it. So the organic types we use for indoor fertilizer is usually in a liquid form and it is a mixture of different natural ingredients like fish emulsion, it can be um, compost tea, it can be warm tea, it can be bone meal, it can be rock phosphor and so on, but all natural ingredients. Uh, and of course the upside to this is that it is completely environmental friendly and it has gone through a minimal process in, in development. Uh, but the negative side is that it's difficult to control the exact nutrient nutrients inside of this liquid. However, if we move on to the inorganic fertilizer, then you have a bigger impact on the environment because it is artificial, it's manufactured. Uh, but in that process, we can actually determine exactly 
what type of nutrients we want and in what type of concentration we want it. So it's more easy to really pinpoint that type of fertilizer for each plant or each plant group. Now we have a different variety of nutrients that we take into our fertilizer and we divide them up into two different types. Now we have the micronutrients and we have the macronutrients and we have the micronutrients. Now the macronutrients, why we call it that is because we often, uh, we often put them out in a percentage of the total uh, liquid that we use or the total fertilizer. So there is quite a lot of these inside of our fertilizer. And those are the big three, of course. We have the nitrogen, the phosphorus, and the potassium. But we also have calcium, sulfur, magnesium, and uh, carbon as well uh, as um, uh, hydrogen also. But we have micronutrients, and we call it that because they are in a very, very small percentage. So we usually talk about parts per million or in milligrams. Uh, and that is the iron, iron, we have copper, boron and zinc and a couple of others that is the micronutrients. Now, that doesn't mean that the macronutrients is much more important, important or efficient for the plant. It only, it's, it's only according to the amount of nutrients we have in our mixture. Uh, so it doesn't mean that nitrogen or that calcium is more, much more important than iron, for instance, because we have to have a good mixture of all of these th that makes up for a very good fertilizer. But we have these and of course we have what we call the big three. And uh, this is usually what we see when we buy a fertilizer it usually says big on the package that we have NPK and also a number to it. So it can be 10, 10, 10, for instance. Now, these numbers are N for nitrogen, we have P for phosphorus, and we have K for potassium. Now, formerly potassium was called kalium, and we actually call that, still call that in Swedish, kalium. Uh, but it, it's called potassium now in, in English form, so that's why... It, but we still use the K. Now, if we have 10, 10, 10, it m roughly means that we have 10% of nitrogen, 10% of phosphorus, and 10% of potassium in our mixture. And then we also have a lot of micronutrients in this mix, but they are so small that we don't, they don't put it on the, on, big on the package. And these are also the three that the plant needs quite a lot of, of course. Now, what do they do? Well, nitrogen is very important for the chlorophyll in the plant. And the chlorophyll, it determines, it, it, the chlorophyll determines that we see the plants as green. And the chlorophyll also is the most important ingredient for picking up the sunlight in, uh, absorbing the sunlight into the plant. So the nitrogen, uh, has a big impact on all of the new tissue and all of the new leaves and also the absorbance of light for the plant. Now phosphorus works in a different way. It is very important for the plant in, uh, in, in cell division, for instance, and also in root growth. And it has a very important function also in plants that are flowering or bearing fruit as well. Now, potassium has another important role inside of the plant. Uh, and one of the biggest is that it actually helps to regulate the stomata. And the stomata is, in Swedish, we call it klivöppninga. The stomata is, in every leaf of the plant, we have small openings, uh, or small windows that can be opened and closed. Now, the potassium helps this process by opening and closing those. And this regulates a lot of things in the plant. It regulates the flow of water because it, the water evaporates. When you open those windows, water evaporates, which allows water to, 
be sucked up through the roots and to move inside of the plant. It also helps with the uptake of carbon dioxide in the air. When we open th those windows, it can suck up or absorb the carbon dioxide as well. Now, it also helps with the storage of the sugars and mainly to store the sugars when winter is coming because one of the things that the plant is doing to prepare itself for the cold weather in winter is that it stores a lot of sugars and it takes away a lot of water inside of the system to be able to withstand those cold. And the, the potassium helps the plant to store these sugars inside of the plant. And also it, it helps the plant to be more immune to diseases. It helps with the immune system of the entire plant. Now those are the big threes. Now important to consider here is that when we add, add these nutrients to the plant, we often add them in liquid form or in small pelletonized form, but they dissolve as we give water to them. So it's basically the same thing. They are water soluble. Uh, so, and what happens then is that we're actually adding these as a salt form to, to the roots and to the plant. Now that means that we have to have a soil or a substrate that is able to pick up those salt nutrients and then distribute them to the root system so that the plant can use those nutrients. Now what I mean by that is that we have different particles inside of our container. Now if you have a soil, the particles here are a mixture of different things. They are a mixture of uh, gravel, of clay, of silt, of organic material such as peat moss and other types. So it's, it, it's a mixture of different components. Uh, so, and what happens here is that any of these components in that mixture need to have something that we call a cation exchange capacity. Now, in short, it's called SIC, cation exchange capacity. What that means is that some of these particles need to have an electric charge so that they have a negative charge around that particle. So, and only a couple of these particles are going to have that because not all particles in a soil has this capacity. Now, we use a lot of pumice, for instance. So pumice is an inorganic material and it doesn't have a cation exchange capacity. So if we planted our plants in pure pumice, we would have a problem because we have no way of capturing the nutrients that we need for the roots and for the plants. It's just going to go straight through and end up down in the water in the bottom of the pot. That is why in pumice we add clay, for instance. Clay has a cation exchange capacity. It has an electric charge around the particles. And what happens is that as we water this, as the nutrients come down with, together with the water, they're actually the different, uh, the different uh, nutrients are going to attach to these particles. So we have the different types of, different type of nutrients are going to attached to the clay particles or uh, other particles that has this cation exchange capacity is for instance peat moss or uh, sphagnum moss. Uh, most of the organic material in a soil has this capacity in different varieties and also clay has this capacity. So it locks on the nutrients to that particle and when our root system comes here in between it going to, it's going to be able to pick up those nutrients for the plant. So this is a very important thing that we have that cation exchange capacity. So now that we know what nutrients are, when do we add fertilizer or nutrients? And uh, I've said many times before on this channel that we only give nutrients or fertilizer when the plant is feeling well. Now that I need to explain a little bit more. 
Uh, now you know that when we add the nutrients, it is in salt form. Now this is, has a direct impact on when we fertilize. Because if we fertilize when the plant is inactive, when it's not sucking up as much water, when it's not pushing nutrients in, inside of the plant, when it's not active in producing that sugar, when, when it's uh, photosynthesizing, then what we're actually doing is we're just adding more and more and more salt to our closed system. Uh, and what eventually happens is that we get too much salt in our system. And too much nutrients is proactive. It's actually going to be a disadvantage for the plant and not help that. So when do we fertilize? Well, the answer is we fertilize when the plant is active. Because then we know that it's going to be using that supplement that we are adding to our system. Now, when is the plant active? We have two different seasons for indoor plants when they are extremely active. Now, the first one, of course, being spring. The plant notices it also inside that we get more light, longer time during the day. We get a higher, um, we get a higher humidity inside and uh, the plant reacts with starting to grow. Now, this is when we start to fertilize in the, in the year, when spring is coming and we, we see that the plant is starting to drink more water and it's going to be active. Then we fertilize. Then, during the hottest part of the summer, the plant is actually going to go dormant. Because when it's really, really hot, we have a lot of sunlight coming through our windows, hitting the plant. The only thing the plant is doing is trying to regulate that heat. So it's not going to be active in trying to produce new leaves, trying to be, produce bigger root system. It's actually just going to be sucking up a lot of water to try and regulate that heat. And it's dormant. We call that a dormancy. So we have a dormancy in the middle of the summer. And that time of year, we do not add fertilizer. But then when it's starting to become a little bit cooler again, then we have autumn coming. And that is another, another growing period. And the, the plant is beginning to be active again. Then we can hit it with fertilizer again because we know it's going to be active. Now, in autumn, it's active in a different way. It, perhaps it's not going to be very visually active. It's not going to get a lot of new leaves. It's not going to be growing as much. However, it is active because it's active by producing more roots, um, bunking up for what's coming, which, may, which means the winter is coming, uh, and um, trying to get a better immune system and just preserving the entire processes inside of the plant. Then we hit it with fertilizer again. And when winter is coming, the plant realizes that because it's getting darker, we get uh, less light during the day. And also inside we get the uh, humidity goes down again and the plant goes dormant. Now, if we continue to fertilize it then, then probably we're going to add too much salt to our system and it's proactive. So the, uh, too much salt in the water means that the plant cannot access that water because the salt is holding the water. So we fertilize two, type, two times a year. We fertilize in spring, we fertilize in autumn, and we have two dormancy periods where we don't fertilize, middle of the summer when it's the warmest and also in wintertime. Now, one more thing about when we fertilize. And now we have over 20 years experience of taking care of thousands and thousands of plants. And one thing that we have realized is that it's more important that you fertilize than what type of fertilizer you use. Um, so which type of brand you use or which type of, uh, if you use 10-10-10 or 5-3-5 or 
the different types of NPK you can get. Forget that. If you're not a grower, if you don't have an extreme passion for a specific type of plant that you have different varieties of, it's more important that you continue, that you fertilize when the plant is active than which specific type of fertilizer you use. So when you buy a fertilizer, make sure that you buy a fertilizer that covers all the macronutrients and all the micronutrients and that it's, it says on it that it is a all-round fertilizer that has all of these components. And then exactly which amount they have, it's not as important as that you do it. Okay, moving on to the next big point here, and that is how much do we fertilize? And I know a lot of you are probably sitting very anxious and it, now it's going to tell us exactly how much we need to use to our plants. It's not that easy, of course. Uh, now, and this is a very important thing. We use as much fertilizer as the brand you have bought recommends you to do. I'm not a big fan of reading instructions, but this is somewhere you have to read the instructions. If you bought a organic or an inorganic fertilizer, read on the box and they give you exact, the exact amount you're supposed to be add and also how often you can add it and follow that instructions because otherwise we will be in the same point as if we give the fertilizer in the, the, in the wrong period or the wrong time of the year. That is that if you add too much, we get too much salt in our container and it will damage the plant instead of help the plant. So follow the instructions. If you use inorganic, if you use organic, that is completely up to you and what you're able to get a hold of, but follow the instructions on the box. Now, as in when we fertilize, our experience here on how much we fertilize is the same thing. It's more important that you fertilize, that you go out and buy a brand, any brand, any type of brand that is an all-around fertilizer. That's more important than which specific type of brand you choose. Now, if you are growing lemons, for instance, then it might be very important for you to check what type of brand, what type of different percentages of nitrogen, phosphorus, and so on that they use. But if we talk about all types of indoor plants, it's more important for you to go out and buy the cheapest brand you can get and use that per instructions than trying on different types of brands and more it's more important that you do it than that you don't. Okay, moving on to the last point for this video, and that is nutrient deficiency. And before we go into which type of deficiencies you can look for, we have to say this. It is very rarely the case that when you see that your plant is not feeling well, it, that it would be a nutrient deficiency. There are a lot of other things that usually are wrong that you have to take care of before it shows a nutrient deficiency. And this is talking about our regular indoor green plants. I'm not talking about growing tomatoes or growing lemons or something that has a fruit or a flower. I'm talking about green household plants. It's very rare that you get a nutrient deficiency. So I, I would say 99 times out of 100, you have another problem than a nutrient deficiency. Because I get this question a lot. I have a plant at home, it's looking like this, it's acting like this. What is it that I'm not adding to the system? Well, my answer is always this. You have a checklist to do before you go in and try that nutrient deficiency, try to make something about that. 
And we have, actually we have four things I want you to look at before you do that. Number one, we need to have a balance between water and oxygen. Uh, we can make this little balance scale here. We need to have a balance between water and oxygen in our pot, in our container. Uh, because if we don't, the plant is not able to suck up these nutrients. It's not able to use those nutrients in a good way. And what I mean by a balance of water and oxygen is that we could have in our system, if we look at the plant and it's not feeling well, something is happening to it. It could be that we have too much water in our system. If we have too much water, it means that we have too we have uh, too little oxygen. And then oxygen defi deficiency is not good for the roots. And how do we get too much water in our system? Well, easily we could have been watering too much. Very often I get the idea that most of household plants, nine household plants out of ten, die of too much water. And why? Well, because we, we look at the plant and we see, oh, it's, it's, it's very dry, it, it's, it's about to die. And we think, okay, I need to water the plant. And we, we water it and we say, ah, I'll add a little bit more water to the system because it's very dry. It needs that extra water. What's actually happening is that when you add that water to a closed system, that water is going down to the bottom of the pot where a lot of the roots are. And those roots are actually going to be living in water for a while. And they can't. They are not water roots that can live in water. They need a balance between water and oxygen. So what you're actually doing by adding that more water is that you're taking away the oxygen for the roots. And those roots are going to start to die. And this is a big, big problem. Another thing you can have too much water in your system is that over time, if you haven't repotted your plant in a very long time, if you have planted it in, in, in soil, that is a lot of organic materials that are going to be decomposing over time. What happens is that all that material that are decomposing, it's actually compacting inside of the plant because it's breaking down into smaller parts all the time. Smaller and smaller parts and it's compacting. And what happens is that after a long period of time, those particles in your pot those decomposed particles are so small that the water is going to attach itself so hard to that particle that the roots can't be able to take that water. It can't suck up that water. So you look at your system and you say, okay, I, I still have moisture, but you have water that the roots can't handle. They can't do anything with that water because it's locked so hard to those compacted small particles. There you have too much water. Now on the other hand, if we have too much oxygen in our system, and we can have that in a different, different ways. Now, the first way can be that we have a loss of percolation, which means that we, if we have a plant that has been planted uh, a long time ago in its pot, it can have an extensive root system inside of this plant. So that when we water, we can actually see that the water is not going down in, into the roots. It's actually going on on the outside of the pot and then trying to because there is so much roots in our system. So we don't get water into where the roots are and we have a loss of percolation. That is one way we can have too much oxygen and that doesn't work either because if we try and add nutrients to that system we have the same thing. It's all going to go down into the bottom of the pot and it doesn't reach the roots. Another way is that when you have repotted a plant, uh, you can get air pockets inside of that. If, we, if you don't see to it that when you add the soil or the pumice or whatever, you can get big air pockets inside of your container. And where those air pockets are, you're not going to get the right amount of water and those roots that are in that spot are going to die. And you can see that on a plant that it's not feeling very well. So that's another thing 
that you could have in your system is root pockets or uh, air pockets for the roots. So this balance, we need to have that all the time. If we don't have that, we never add nutrients. We never... So check your plant. This is the first step. If your plant is not feeling well, okay, do I have a balance of water and oxygen? Does it look like the, the water is going through the system? It's being sucked up. It's not too much water in the system and so on. And if you have this problem, then you repot your plant. You don't add nutrients to this. You repot it instead. Now the second thing you have to look for is pests. It is a lot more common that you get pests on your plants than a nutrient deficiency. And uh, it could look very similar because you see that the plant is not feeling well uh, usually, when you are talking about pests, they attack the newer growth first. So you see a color shift in the new growth. And you see that the plant overall is stunt, stunted a bit. It's, it's sagging a little bit and the new growth are turning a little bit yellow. That is probably not nutrient deficiency. It's probably a pest problem. So. The first thing you do is that you check your plant to see, okay, do I have pests? That is number two. And if you do, then you take care of that problem and you don't add a lot of nutrients to that. You take care of the pest problem. Number three. Light. If your plant is not feeling well, you see that it's, it's starting to turn a little bit shaded. It's just beginning to lose the color. It's starting to become a little bit yellow. It could be that you don't get it uh, enough light. Like we said before, the light is a huge thing for creating that food for the plant. You need sunlight, carbon dioxide and water for that to work. And when that is working, when the photosynthesis is working and that chlorophyll is working perfectly, you get a very nice green color on your plants. Now, if that starts to fade, it could be that you're not giving it enough light. So one thing could be that ju to just move your plants a little bit to a, a lighter spot. And also, of course, you can get too much light as well. If you get too much light and usually that is direct sunlight you can get a burn on the plant so you you're looking at the plant and you see burnt spots you see spots on the on the, on the plant that are uh, turning brown or uh, parts of uh, whole branches of the plant is, is starting to become brown and very dry that could be too much light that it's getting burnt by the sun so too much light or too little light can be one of the problems you have. And the last thing we want to look for is your placement of the plant. Because if it's not feeling well, it could be getting uh, brown tips on all of the leaves. Uh, you could see that entire branches are not feeling so good. It could be your placement as well, not just the light, but the placement. Uh, we get mechanical damages, for instance, on Dracaenas when they stand somewhere where you have a small breeze or where people are moving against the plant a lot. You get brown leaf tips, tips uh, and that doesn't have anything to do with a nutrient deficiency. It has to do with the placement. So just by moving your plant to somewhere else, you're taking care of that problem. So to summarize this, before you go in and try and add nutrients as a solution to a problem, make this checklist. Do I have a balance of water and oxygen in my system? Do I have pests? Take care of them if you do, and then your problem will go away. Do, I, do my plant get as much light as it needs, or is it getting too much light? 
And am I placing the plant in the correct spot or am I getting problems because of that placement? If you can't find anything here and you see that your plant is not feeling well, it's losing its color or some other type of that you can just see that something is wrong, then maybe you have a nutrient deficiency. So if you do, I'm just going to go through the three biggest here, the three bigs. If you have a nutrient deficiency of nitrogen, phosphorus or potassium, how, what, what are you supposed to look for? Um, and I have to say this as well. If you have a deficiency of some of these nutrients, then always try and add a fertilizer that has all of these components. Never go in and just add, try and add nitrogen to your system because some of these actually work together. So you, perhaps you need the iron to, to, to be able to take up the phosphorus. Now you look at it and you see, oh, I probably have a phosphorus problem, but it's really an iron problem or something like that. I'm not going to go that deep, but always add a fertilizer that covers all the spectrum of both micro and macro nutrients. Now, if you have a nitrogen deficiency, this shows on your plants. Uh, and what happens is uh, the leaves are going to start to turn yellow. And it is usually or almost always the older leaves first. So it's usually the leaves in the bottom, those that have been standing the longest in, in your pot. Those are going to start to turn yellow. And then it's going to move up to the more recent leaves. And this is because a nitrogen is a mobile type of nutrient inside of the plant. So what happens is that when you get that deficiency, uh, the plant reacts by taking the little nitrogen that it has left, pushing it up to the newest leaves so that it can continue to grow, uh, but leaving the older leaves in a deficiency. And then it starts to turn yellow and it's the whole leaf. Everything on the leaves starts to turn a little bit yellow. That is how you can see that it's probably nitrogen deficiency. Now, but Phosphorus is a completely different thing. Phosphorus is quite hard to see. Usually when you see that you have a phosphorus deficiency, the plant has gone very, very far in its process uh, and it might not be able to survive. Uh, but if you can see it, it's usually that on the plant, you will get spots or edges or the, uh, the um, backside of your leaves are going to turn a little bit purple or red, red bluish purple. When you see that color, color on your plants, and it can be on the edges, it can be on spots on it, it could be a phosphorus deficiency. But as I said, when you have that, the plant is usually feeling quite bad, so it's not sure that it's going to survive. Now, the last of the big three, we have the potassium. Now, when you get a potassium deficiency, what happens is that the edges of the leaves, or a, at least the tips of the leaves, turn brown uh, and turn very uh, um, dry, brown and dry. So, and usually also it starts to curl a little bit. It can curl on itself. So the edges become brown and they start to curl themselves and they get very, very dry. So when you touch it, it just crumbles and falls off. Um, and also you get a yellowing of the plant as well, like we did with the nitrogen. But when it's potassium that is the deficiency, you get, usually get those burnt looking 
uh, spots. And when it turns yellow, it's also the older leaves. But you can see that the yellowing is actually situated in between the veins of the leaf. So if we look at this one here, we have quite extensive veins on this uh, aglonema. Uh, so if it's potassium deficiency, it would start to turn yellow in between the bigger veins. So the veins would still be green, but the yellowing is occurring in between them. Uh, now, it is very hard to see these deficiencies, as I said before. Uh, and potassium deficiency is very similar to iron deficiency as well. It also becomes very, uh, yellow, you get a yellowing in between the veins. So it's not easy. It's not easy. That is why I'm telling you guys, make this checklist first. If you still can't figure out what is happening, add a fertilizer that covers it all and see if the plant gets to be better. Okay, that's it for today, everyone. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Don't forget to subscri subscribe to our channel. It really helps us a lot. The more of you that subscribes and watch our videos, the more videos we can put out for you. And as usual, if you have a video you would like us to make, it can be on a specific plant or something we have taken up today, please don't hesitate to make a comment in the commentary section. Now, as usual, we try and take all those questions and then we make a Q&A video. So we are not going to be able to answer you in that commentary section, but stay tuned and look out for the Q&A videos. And don't forget to hit that bell as well so you see every time we put up a new video. Until next time, I don't.